Us Boys and Poets. Hey, my name is Katie Ritchie. Everybody say hi, Katie. Hi, so nice to see you this afternoon. Um, we're going to have an excellent program for you, some really great poetry. I hope you came to hear poetry. Did you come to hear poetry? Yeah. Excellent, you're in the right place. Um, well, you're going to hear some, and you might choose, I hope, to do a little writing as well. We have what's called the community poem. Yeah, I know, it's so fun, trust me. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's one of my favorite parts. So this is how the community poem works. We start with a line from another poet, and in the beginning of the open mic, I'll read you that poem. Um, this uh, afternoon's poet, poet is Hugh Min Nguyen, uh, and he has a poem called Changeling. So we start with a line from his poem, and yep, Hugh snaps for you. Uh, we start with a line from his poem, and then everybody who would like to adds a line, and at the very end, I read you back your poem. It's super exciting. Yay! So, um, I chose a line today that I just thought, you never know where it's going to go. Um, there's not a lot to it, but I, I'm, I'm really hopeful for it. So, it, the line is, standing in front of a mirror. What are you going to do with that, audience? It's so exciting, the tension in the room. Uh, so, standing in front of the mirror is our first line, and anybody who would volunteer to write our second line. Oh, come on, be brave. Hey, thank you so much. Okay, so in the back's going to uh, do our second line. We'll pass it around, and by the end, we'll have a lovely poem to read back. Cool? All right, please give it up now for my fabulous co-host, Sarah Browning. Good afternoon, beautiful people. Hi. That's when you say hi back. Hi. All right. And I think you should take a moment and look around at each other because you are a beautiful crowd. Maybe I don't need to adjust the mic. Thank you, Anthony. Can we give it up for Anthony, everybody, who's filming today? And uh, if you're up on the open mic, you're going to get filmed today unless you tell Anthony that you don't want to be filmed. So Katie will remind you of that again when she comes back. Um, my name is Sarah Browning. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Split This Rock, which has been sponsoring Sunday Kind of Love here in the Langston Room at Bus Boys and Poets. We're now in our 12th year. <laughs> How about that? How about that? We have a really special Sunday kind of love this month in March on the theme of migration. And our poets are Jose Gonzalez and Wo Chan. Let's give it up for our poets in the house. And today's Sunday kind of love is co-sponsored in addition to Split This Rock and Bus Boys and Poets by two really essential organizations, Kundiman, an organization for Asian poets and poetry, <laughs> and Letras Latinas, the literary arts program of the Institute for Latino Studies at Notre Dame University. And we're very pleased and honored to have with us the director of Letras Latinas, Francisco Aragon. Thank you, Francisco. And thank you to Kundiman. So this migration theme was dreamed up by a brand new coalition of over 20 poetry organizations all over the country that present, publish, celebrate the art form, the living, breathing, beautiful, and essential art form of poetry. And we came up with this issue many, many months ago. Sadly, tragically, maddeningly, enragingly, this theme is all the more germane today. And I apologize, I'm getting over a nasty, scratchy thing, so <clears throat> I might be doing that a few times. I should have brought my water. Um, someone, don't make the pregnant lady come with the water. Thank you. Um, work, next month, Katie's going to be on leave because there's going to be a baby Katie poetry baby in the house. Thank you, Simone. Migration is a fundamental human right. Movement, 
is what people and organisms and languages and water do. It's what we do, we move. Is someone beeping? Thank you. And uh, yet, so many, including those who now dwell at that house at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, at least part-time, <laughs> part-time, because part we're paying for them to go elsewhere, um, are telling us that we have to keep others out, that we have to build a wall around this society that pretty soon, if they have their way, nobody's going to want to come here anyway. So we have to fight. And part of the way that we fight is, is with our words, with the language of poetry, the imaginative language of poetry that tells our stories. I know that all of us in this room have stories of our own families' migrations. Washington, D.C. was made by the migration of African Americans from the South. That's what built this city. My own mother was a refugee from the war in London, from the bombing. She came across as a five-year-old child on the last boat of refugees, last boat of civilians, to cross the Atlantic in 1940. She would not be, I would not be here if this country hadn't welcomed her and her mother and her brother. And I know painfully that they did that in part because she was British and white-skinned and spoke English. And I think of the shiploads full of Jews who were turned back. And many people in this nation said never again, and yet here we are again. So the poets tell our stories. They tell our American stories. They tell our human stories. And that's some of what we'll be hearing today. So I'm very, very pleased that you're all here and delighted to spend the afternoon with you and grateful to the co-sponsoring organizations for today's program. The um, hashtag is we come from everything. Because we come from everything, poetry and migration is the name of this project and it comes from a line in a poem by our U.S. Poet Laureate Juan Felipe Herrera. So please check that out, hashtag we come from everything or hashtag poetry coalition to learn more about it. There are also postcards on the table. And Split This Rock is dedicated to this kind of poetry that you'll hear, poetry that bears witness to injustice and provokes personal and social change. We are heading into our 10th anniversary in 2018, which will be the date of our next National Poetry Festival. I hope you'll all come, Split This Rock Poetry Festival. It's like no other gathering anywhere in the United States, right here in Washington, D.C., and you have lots of time to plan for it. And actually, this week, we're marking the ninth anniversary of Split This Rock. It's kind of remarkable. The first Split This Rock Poetry Festival was March 20th to the 23rd of 2008. So, whew, yeah. So in addition to this poetry festival and a weekly poem of the week that you can sign up for at our table, uh, we also have a robust area-wide youth program. It's really the largest and most dynamic um, youth poetry program in the DC area. And one of those programs is the DC Youth Slam Team. Yeah. And the finals, the Grand Slam finals for the 2017 team are next weekend, Saturday the 25th at Arena Stage. Please grab the gorgeous flyer on the table or you can go right now to splitthisrock.org to buy your tickets. Only $15. Only $15. Only $15 in advance. And you don't want to miss these young people. They're going to be 10 of the most incredible visionary, thoughtful, and brilliant youth poets competing for five slots on the team. So it'll be um, high stakes poetry uh, <laughs> next weekend, Saturday night. Please join us. And um, the tickets are going fast, so get online and buy them um, while you're here or when you get home tonight and grab a flyer and put it on your fridge. Um, let me introduce, woo, I'm getting notes. <clears throat> ah. 
Thank you. So there are going to be some more chairs being put out in front in just a few minutes if you're waiting for a place to sit. Um, so we'll have a little break before I bring up the first poet. We'll have just a three minute setup break. All right? Because we're popular this afternoon, apparently. So, but let me. Let me take a minute to introduce my brilliant colleagues who are here. Kamisha Jones, Managing Director of Split This Rock, is at the table. <laughs> Simone Roberts, Poetry and Social Justice Fellow. <laughs> Split This Rock Board Chair, Dan Vera. <laughs> and did Kit come in? No? OK. So um, am I missing anybody? At the moment, I don't think I am. Um, also coming up is um, every year, every other year, that is on off years from our festival, we give an award for poetry and activism, and it's called the Freedom Plow Award for Poetry and Activism. And we have chosen four finalists, and I'm pleased to say that Francisco Aragon is one of them for the award this year, and we will be announcing the winner this week. <coughs> and the award ceremony will be at the Arts Club of Washington on April 21st. Um, it will be a really powerful and moving and fun event. So grab a little flyer for that on the table as well, and come out and join us. Tickets for that, including uh, light refreshments and this fabulous program are only $25. Oh, wow. Only $25. Yeah. So um, next month, Sunday Kind of Love, always the third Sunday of every month at 5 o'clock. Next month, the powerful and brilliant local poet Joseph Ross will be launching his third book right here on this stage, Ache. Woo! Let's give it up for Joe. And Joe has recruited two poets to read briefly with him. Fred Joyner will be coming up from uh, North Carolina. And myself, which I'm really honored and thrilled. So that'll be really great. And um, finally, before we take our two minute break, um, I want to thank Andy Shalal, who's the owner of Bus Boys and Poets, who provides this beautiful room and has, as I said, we're in our 12th year with Sunday Kind of Love. Um, and so let's give it up for Andy and all the incredible staff here at Bus Boys and Poets for this beautiful room. And to our servers, they work hard. Uh, over the course of this kind of event. And you might just have a cup of tea or a cocktail if you're like me. Um, and um, so tip them generously. You know, until we can get rid of the tipping system and just have everyone have a living wage. Uh, yeah. Wait staff rely on, on all of us. So please be generous. Um, they work hard. Thank you. Um, Jose has books. And I'll tell you about his book when, um, when I introduce him in just a minute. He has them for sale. You can buy them directly from him after the program, and he'll sign them for you. They're only $10. Oh, $10. OK, we're going to take our two-minute break. We're going to have chairs, and then I'm going to come back up and introduce Jose. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> All right, how about that for efficiency? <laughs> Are you ready for some poetry? Yeah. All right. You know, that's when I, I try to channel like my inner spoken word host and say, when I say spoken, you say word. Spoken. Word. Spoken. Word. When I say to be, you say heard. To be. Word. To be. Word. When I say split this, you say rock. Split this. Rock. Split this. Rock. Split this. Rock. All right. I did it. Thank you. All right. Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first poet, Jose B. Gonzalez. He's the author of the International Book Award finalist, Toys Made of Rock, which he has here for sale for only $10. It's a thing. It never gets old, really. 
Um, and the book is based on his life growing up both in El Salvador and in the US. His work has been anthologized in the Norton Introduction to Literature, Theater Under My Skin, Contemporary Salvadoran Poetry, and The Wandering Song, Central American Writing in the United States, which we launched with Tia Chucha Press right here in this room just a month ago at a fabulous reading. He's the co-editor of Latino Boom, an anthology of US Latino literature, and editor of latinostories.com, a Fulbright scholar. Jose teaches Latino literature and creative writing at the US Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut. I give you Jose Gonzalez. <laughs> Sarah, that's some kind of Sunday kind of love. You're getting the crowd really warmed up here. Holy cow. All right. Latino author, you have to lower this all the time. I have to admit, full disclosure, last time I read in DC, I thought I was doing well. And of course, I did the whole body check, zipper check, and didn't realize, even though it was being webcast, that my shirt was out. I was wearing this green shirt, so it looks like I have a green penis. And, 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 and I had no clue about this the whole time. I'm thinking, wow, that was good. So I get out and people are clapping. Some are smiling a little too much. I thought they were smoking a little too much. And sure enough, when I looked at it online, I was like, wow, look at that green penis. But anyway, uh, I don't have a green penis uh, uh, poem. Let me finish that. But I do, <laughs> I do have a few here and there. Uh, with um, this really important theme, right? Uh, migration. And the first poem I'm going to read to you is called Sociology 101, Essay on Illegal Immigration. My words corralled inside the margins of a paper that described illegal immigration. Each sentence tried to follow assignment guidelines. Research, the professor had said, is to come from published scholars, experts who had studied the impact on, of illegal immigration on this nation. They had uncles named Sam. Well, I had one named Eduardo. What was I to do with him? Without a vita, without a visa, without immigration papers, he had become an expert on how to hire the right coyote. Having been hog-tied by the migra on his first attempt, he grew eyes on the back of his head and learned that the trick to running is to sprint before a starting pistol makes its first sound. He hurtled over the U.S.-Mexico border on his second try and kept his feet going until he could no longer hear a coyote's howl or an immigration officer's growl. As hard as I tried to keep him from stepping foot on my paper, it was impossible to block him from running through the margins. The day I quoted him, Uncle Eduardo he took away the job of a published researcher who was in this country legally, I was sure. As he described the three-week trek from a bus station in El Salvador, crossing the heart of rattling deserts to the mouth of Connecticut, my notes could not catch up with his words. He shifted through memories as if he was afraid of someone snatching them from him. Stacking my report on top of essays with alien titles, I could see the C that would eventually be placed on my cover page for allowing my uncle to trespass the same way I would the following semester in Introduction to American Literature where I raised my hand and uttered the lonely word, but. Thank you, thank you. So I have this mouse that's been driving me crazy at home, you know. Um, and for some reason or other, I, you know, suburban living, come from Connecticut, and city living for me is pretty easy, but, but suburban living and, and being out with, with mice, it's kind of a little, little, little too much. So uh, this one's called City Mouse Chase. That midnight mouse used to serenade through plaster walls, used to be awakened by the te amos of midnight novelas or the te matos of scorned lovers. Or more likely, the scent of the evening's rice and beans would seep through keyholes and door cracks and tap its back, pointing in my direction. That mouse followed my tracks from Federal to Huntington to Thompson and even to Fort Trumbull. 
after college, I swore he'd never find a trace of me. But last night, in between slipping in a dream of being in a one-family house, a paradise without nighttime sounds, a mansion where I'd be the one scratching a vinyl record track without worrying about a fall of a crumb, I heard the walls poison ivy scratching. I made pretend that it had crawled into my imagination, a part of a montage of clouds and baseballs floating into planets, the child of a nor'easter having a good laugh, but the traces of my life, or warnings of my future, started appearing in sinks and cupboards, outside of drywalls, inside my bookshelves, claiming victory by leaving shreds of verse in scattered piles. But the day that the mouse devoured Neruda's lines, the victory was mine. The letters scattered, maybe even lost, that mouse must have laughed when it caught up to Machu Picchu and erased the heights, leaving a heap of dust. His weakness was in the dawn, but my strength is in memory of spirits. I have studied their words. I have read them. I have seen the color of night when we forget. Thank you. Stop it. He's just, he's just doing that to make me nervous. All right. So this one, I read at, uh, writer, at a Writers of Resistance event. And I have to tell you that when I read at that event, I was expecting, first of all, other writers to kind of be in tune considering everything that's happening in this country. And um, I, I was surprised, actually, that, that not everyone was on the same page. Uh, and so I thought, these folks here, they look like they'd be in the same page, so I'll have to try this out with you. And, you know, dreams, uh, drums of resistance, I'm sorry. Drums of resistance. There is no precedence to this president, and since there have been so many incidents that have left our knuckles tense, our intuition is to recite our resistance to uncommon sense. Our revolutions may not be televised, our revolutions may not be televised, but our rights will be exercised, our rights will be exercised. And even as we hear the drums of damning, even as we hear the drums of damning, our rights will be exercised. That drum says, damn if I be damned. That drum says, damn the ones who damn. That drum says, damn if I be damned. The drum says, this damn won't be breached. That drum says, damn if I be damned. The drum says, frankly, Mr. President, I do give a damn. That drum says, damn if I be damned. That drum says, give me liberty, but don't give me dams. The, that drum says, damn if I be damned. That drum says, Mr. President, tear down this damn wall. The drum says, damn if I be damned. The drum says, damn the missiles, damn the torpedoes, damn all weapons of mass destruction. That drum says, damn if I be damned. That drum says, I'm not damned if I do, but I'll be damned if I don't. That drum says, damn if I be damned. The drum says, we believe in our nation, not in damnation. That drum says, damn if I be damned. The drum says, keep your tiring dams, your damning of the poor, and your huddled dams yearning to look up to lock up the free. That drum says, damn if I be damned. That drum says, the only thing we have to fear is the damning of ourselves. That drum says, damn if I be damned. That drum says, I've heard this beat before. That drum says, I've heard this beat before. The gift we bring to our new king. Drum, 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 drum. Our finest gifts we sing. Drum, 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 drum. So to honor our ancestors' hymns, we bring frankincense with a touch of common sense. Drum, 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 drum. The drum says, I've heard this beat before. The drum says, I've heard that beat in the beatings of protesters who wanted to sing give me liberty or give me drum 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 that drum says we the people don't believe in global damning drum 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 that, that drum says we believe in the American dream not the American damning drum 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 that drum says we believe in resistant drums not petulant petulant trumpets drum 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 Shall we pray for you? Drum, 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 drum. Wall Street stocks won't keep our time. Drum, 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 drum. Our revolutions may not be televised. Our revolutions may not be televised. 
but our rights will be exercised. Our rights will be exercised. That drum says that hypocritic oath means nothing. Drum, 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 drum. Drum says, my fellow Americans, ask not how your leaders condemn you. Ask what you can do to stop the damning. Drum, 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 drum. We'll play our drum for him. Drum, 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 drum. That drum says, we have an Uncle Sam, not an Uncle Dam. Drum, 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 drum. We will pray for you. Drum, 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 drum. We will play for you. Drum, 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 drum. We and our drums. We and our drums. We and our drums. Thank you. Thank you. So. Now I read, well actually some of those poems are from Toys Made of Rock, and they, um, the reason why I'm reading from this instead of this, full disclosure once again, you, 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 I'm giving you, you know, TMI here, but my, um, my eyesight is so poor that I have to cheat. So no bifocals for me, but this one right here, Hollow Shells Revisited, right? I have an uncle who just passed away yesterday. That uncle was the one who drove my sister and me to the airport um, when we came to this country. First my father came, uh, earned some money, then my mother came, and then a few years later we all got together. So um, this poem is based on his son, actually, my cousin. Hollow Shells Revisited. We were maybe babies, licking then picking guavas off trees, cousin Chin and me. We'd climb to the top of rot and sing teases in our neighbor, to our neighbor's wild gallo who'd get his revenge at the gloss of dawn, cock a doodle to us into the outdoors before the first cup of chuco was sold on the streets where we'd spend days slinging rocks. And when street lights signaled their first round of warnings, we'd rush to beat the unbuckling of a belt or the bristle of a broom, sneak into the back of a room and pretend that our hours had been spent at home, waiting for the last bus to slip past the sun and baptize the night. Every few moons would be given away and caught by a chipped tooth or a scarred sidewalk. Mostly, we'd forget our punishments by the next sun unless it was a Saturday night when we'd get lost in the weekend's offbeat and walk into a room full of men who would gather in Chin's house to talk Molina, Norton, and Ali. They'd wrap revenge in soft blows and begin sentences with words like la, 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 and las, 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 condemning the last names of presidents and the capital's residents who preached pride but stood by when the first flagpole fell into a hole. By the time of Ali and Norton too, I had moved closer to Macintosh trees, to the land of American pies, and Cheen was allowed uh, inside private doors, becoming a yes man, listening to no men talk about la, 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 and las, las, las. Every now and then, a picture of Cheen so thin would catch up to me. The last one came during college when I was reading textbooks about the nomics of nomics, of how pennies were supposed to roll so smoothly off dollars. While our newspapers were reporting that Ron was doing wrong by trading weapons for something, someone, La Prensa published the picture of Chin at 14 in a story about his sentence for hosting Guerrilla Saturdays. For years I wrote essays but not letters. It wasn't for a lack of ink, but more like the books I read said Chin's chin had a goatee like Chez. He seemed to be the kind of radical, they said, who would kill priests, nuns, Jesuits, just for the injustice of it. I believed in our government, not him. After his time, he moved to the States to an apartment in the Bronx. Relatives said it was small, like a prison. They told me I had to visit. In time, I said. But I'd use my Jeep as an excuse. Too many miles, a ping in the engine. I'd tell them I didn't want to get lost in the New York streets. I could shake them off, but that photo of him, I couldn't shake, couldn't shake that. 
I have yet to see the graffiti art that I've been told wraps around his apartment's walls, the lines on bricks claiming that love exists and that Kilroy lived there. I've train tripped to New York City to catch Broadway, 42nd Street twice, Jets, Giants, Yankees, art exhibits, Madison Square, Madison Square Garden, and each time I've gone, I've avoided his part of the Bronx, kept driving around and round. I've done what I could to stop hearing the sounds of sentences beginning with the words, la, 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 and las, las, las. Done what I could to avoid hearing words that I should have heard all along. La, 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 las, las, las. La, 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 las, las, las. Words from childhoods lost. Lost, lost, lost. Lost, lost, lost. All right, thank you. Stop it. Stop it. Now you're <laughs> so this one right here it 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 uh is in the Norton in the latest edition of the Norton and I have to say there's a story behind this poem because I know there's so many of you great talent out here I can feel it and um this is a poem that I sent to Kalalu years back and when I sent it I I never heard from them I didn't even get a rejection and I felt like wow I didn't even I didn't, it must have been a horrible poem this is like this is a poem that that I, I need to take off my manuscript I, I need to burn it I need to like erase it no trace of it whatsoever unless WikiLeaks finds it that, that's it it's gone right and 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 then about again about three years after I sent it out I get an an email telling me that Kalalu was including it in a special edition. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll put it back in my manuscript then. <laughs> and then. And then last summer, I got an email asking for permission to publish it. The point is that a lot of times as writers, we tend to be our own worst critics, and sometimes you look for that endorsement elsewhere, right? And so I think that's a pretty good story for, for all of us in terms of like, you know, keeping our heads up and, and not taking rejection as a meaning of anything, really. Um, so this one's called Elvis in the Inner City. I was Elvis in the 70s, not swinging hips, not wearing suede shoes, but just the same. In canvas Chuck Taylors with my own spelt moves, spinning rap, scratching vinyl to the tunes of Curtis Blow, the Sugar Hill Gang, Grandmaster Flash, and the hip hop of the hip 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 of other rappers, making rap mine, rhyming to the boogie to the boom of the beat beat beat. Mom and Dad's charros, same as Lawrence Walk instrumentals, were stuff of old country boleros, but I had my rap bebop and I'd rap, rap, rap. The other side of the city, like the flip side of a one-hit wonder, bop heads to Van Morrison, Jim Morrison, and Van Halen, but I couldn't break a pop to lyrics that weren't about me. Inner city, inequality, in the record store, I be. Boom boxes. Size of refrigerators walked up and down projects giving concerts for free and rap was made for me until I, a lone white square on a checkerboard reciting amidst blacks of the block froze, could not get my lips to vibrate sink the refrain of the word nigger I, rockless, rapply, ra rapless without a side A nor a side B stuttered, strutted, struggled to find someone who would Rhyme with me. All right. Now you're all kind. All right. I need a drink of water before this one because this is this is a long one and I and I read it fast. It's called autobiography, right? Autobiography of a New England Latino, and it's just that, right? An autobiography about my brown skin. The reason why I read it fast is because life goes by so fast. Autobiography of a New England Latino. In 1967, San Salvador, El Salvador fathered my brown and so I was born in the capital that salutes the Pacific, the mother of so many brown rivers, lakes, ponds that held hands with volcanic rocks that tumbled brown, burned the soil brown, and browned the country in civil brown turmoil in the 1970s when my family left to New England where factories, my mother's sewing machine, and my father's spray paint machine were brown, and I first attended John Winthrop Elementary School, a school full of browns, a separate but equal type of brown that was not El Salvador brown, but a desperate
district to move out of the projects, Brown, and so my parents poured their wages into tuition for a private middle school classroom where I was the only Brown, and I was taught to make my language a less subtle Brown, so that by the time I attended New London High School, which had shades of Puerto Rican Brown and tints of Latin American Brown, I had shed so much Brown that I was accused of not being enough Brown, but I figured I, I knew the roots of my Brown and, and felt comfortable enough with my Brown, even if I was losing some of my Spanish Brown, and I continued to lose it too, not because I wanted to, but because most of the brown at the college I attended was a Republican brown, which spoke a different dialect of brown, and by the end of my four years, my Spanish brown had faded so much that it became an anglicized Spanish brown, and I was awarded the college's Excellence in English Award, which I was pretty sure I had never been giving to a graduating brown, and when they said this year's recipient is Jose Gonzalez Brown, I could have sworn I saw hundreds of people scrape their ears in an attempt to fix whatever was making them hear brown, and, and, and and after graduating, I figured I'd get a job teaching English even if I was brown, but in an interview for an English teaching position at a small boarding school, headmaster told me if I was serious about getting a job, I'd teach Spanish brown because there's such a shortage of Spanish browns, to which I said, thank you headmaster, but I'd just assume not teach Spanish brown, and when his eyes said, Thank you, Mr. Brown, but unless you're willing to teach Spanish Brown, I wouldn't have a job for you, Mr. Brown. I changed my mind and did what I had to, even if my first language was no longer Spanish Brown. And I taught there until one brown day in the middle of the school year. I just had to ask him, I know you hired me for something else, but someday can I teach English here, even if I am Brown? And his office door replied with, if you didn't want to teach Spanish Brown, maybe you shouldn't have been Brown, which told me it was time for me to leave that master and get my master's, and I decided to attend what else? Brown University, <laughs> Brown University, which was Ivy League Brown. And you want to talk about a different shade of Brown? This was like a culture shock Brown. Mommy, help me. This is a bad novella. i never seen this before kind of Brown. And there were so many educated liberal Browns, I thought there had been some kind of going out of business clearance sale on diplomas for Browns. Not that the majority was Brown, but I just wasn't too used to associating the college experience with Browns. So even a little bit of Browns was enough to make me think that colleges were turning somewhat Brown. And while at Brown, a student taught at Providence's Hope High School, which had many Browns. So I wanted very badly for my student to recognize my Brown and say, if he's at Brown and he's Brown, there's hope for us young Browns. But they just thought I was Brown University Brown, not inner city Brown, and students couldn't see themselves in my Brown. And so unaccustomed were they to seeing any shade of Brown in front of their class that they thought it was impossible that I could be raised Brown. But I didn't let that get me too much down, and when I graduated from Brown, I became a Brown Brown, a Brown Squared, a Brown Times Brown, which for some people, teachers even, only meant that I was Ivy Brown because I am Brown, which made me want to point to Brown graduates who were Brown because their parents or grandparents were Brown, making them legacy Browns, Browns cubed, and I continued my schooling at the University of Rhode Island and worked toward my PhD because of, not in spite of being Brown, and I studied literature that was Brown because growing up, I had been assigned stories like Young Goodman Brown, but I had never been assigned a book by a Brown author, which never made sense to me because I just knew that in all the years that Browns had been in the U.S., even in the part that was Brown before the U.S. became the U.S., Browns had to have something to say, even if it wasn't about being Brown. And while I worked on my Brown dissertation, I taught there, I, uh, sorry, I, I, I taught English at Three Rivers Community College, which had quite a few Browns, so many of whom juggled coursework with family and jobs and being Brown, that it was tough for them to one day say I have a college degree even though I'm brown, which made me appreciate being educated and being brown and I became ABD, a brown doctor, and probably became URI's first English PhD and uh, PhD brown, which isn't that big a deal because in higher education if you're brown you can lay claim to this and that. As being, uh, and that's why when I tell people that I'm a professor of English, every once in a while someone says something like, Dr. Brown, you must teach us a different type of English that has to have some kind of Brown. Maybe teach second language Brown English or remedial Brown English or developmental English for the Brown, because after all you're Brown. But it matters none to me, master of my own Brown destiny, because even on the coldest, snowiest day in Connecticut, even when it seems I've been Brown beaten, I can still feel the power of my own Brown, Brown like a Brown who beat the board of ed, brown like a brown trunk of a brown tree that's been whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked until it's become nothing but a strong brown wooden frame that holds a brown diploma high up in the air telling the world I'm educated and I'm brown. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.
That's right. Let's give it up one more time for Jose B. Gonzalez. What a tour de force. How y'all doing? All right. All right. Let's try that again. How y'all doing? All right. Uh, I, you know, I forgot to say the fundamental thing of poetry presenting, <clears throat> which is to please silence your cell phones if you haven't done so already, because it's really uncool, you know, if you get like Kendrick Lamar or something in the middle of your, somebody's really like heartfelt poem, you know, like the dying grandma poem. Yeah. Thank you. Also, we have some really cool merchandise at the table. And we have beautiful uh, Split This Rock t-shirts. They have a quote from Audre Lorde on the back. That will make you the coolest kid on campus or wherever you are. We also have fantastic um, poetry note cards which include excerpts from poems that have been published in our Poem of the Week series and are now gathered on the website of Split This Rock in an online database called The Quarry, a social justice poetry database. You can go there and find poems on any social issue and it's searchable by social issue. So this month's theme, for example, migration and immigration, you can click on that and find um, a couple dozen poems and it's an incredible, incredible resource source for you personally. Any teachers in the house? <laughs> all right. So teaching, activism, please bring poetry into all these spaces. Who needs poetry? Everyone. Everyone. Roque Dalton, Salvadoran poet. Am I right? Salvadoran? Yeah. Said uh, poetry like bread is for everyone. We need it. So um, the poems, uh, the note cards have po excerpts from poems in the quarry paired with beautiful artwork by our very own Dan Vera. They are beautiful. And the, the note cards are only $2.50. Only? Only, yeah. Um, they are individually. And you can also buy a set of seven. There are seven different ones for how much? How much is a set of seven? I can't remember. Fifteen dollars? Yes. Only fifteen, yeah. So, um, see Kamisha, they're really stunning. All right, our next poet. Our next poet is Wo Chan. <laughs> Wo is a poet, writer, and drag performer. Holds honors from Kundiman, Lambda Literary, the Malay Colony of the Arts, and the Asian American Writers Workshop. And is the author of the chapbook, Order the World, Mom. Wo has performed their work at New York Live Art, Dixon Place, Bam Fisher, Vox, Populi, and the Architectural Digest Expo. They are a standing member of the Brooklyn-based Drag and Burlesque Alliance Switch and Play. I give you Wo Chan. Okay, great. Oh, thank you for inviting me here. I've never, so I always knew this place existed, but I've never uh, been here. And I always imagined it was much smaller of a space, but this is like a fortress of culture. Like there's this humongous restaurant and then more restaurant and like a wraparound bookstore. Like I never thought this was, this like place was here, this, this large. But I'm amazed, so thank you for having me. Mm -mm. Let's see. Maybe it's easier to do this. Yeah, so um, I was thinking about migration, and uh, this phrase popped up uh, seeking safety, which is actually a, a therapy program 
that my best friend does. And uh, I don't go to therapy, but I ask uh, all my friends who go to therapy about their therapy. So it's like I get this trickle-down therapy effect. If anyone tries to sell you trickle-down therapy, don't buy it because it's not a real thing. But um, seeking safety is like a, specifically for PTSD. And um, I think a lot about my parents and the fact that they were born um, in the middle of the Great Chinese Famine, where, I mean, not a lot of people know about the Great Chinese Famine unless you studied it, but basically um, government policy uh, ended up killing 30,000, 30 million, sorry, 30 million Chinese people um, just through starvation because uh, crops were, um, you know, they were told that they couldn't grow certain things and crops were being taken away. Um, but that was my, my parents' first memory of living, was starving and having their neighbors disappear because children were dying. Um, and I don't think it's any accident that uh, my family owns a restaurant now uh, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, where I grew up. And um, it's sort of beautiful to be back in DC in this area with some college friends or in the audience as well. Um, yeah. So I grew up in Virginia. Um, this is a poem titled Such As. It's in three parts. Such as peril, fever, collection of pages, heavy, a hard macaroni, and a quick brick road. Caution, dandelion, damp floor, a cracked saucer of horseradish, of children and lost suburbs, school bus of nostalgia, the oxbone kingdom, a river, a yoke, a sack, that certain type of happiness, sliver of bright butter, ripe lemon, dry urine, porch light, invisible, dull gold, fried blonde, firefly, corona, monster eye, such as what to do when someone sings so sweetly, an epithet is singing so sweetly beside you, your epithet, smiling and joyous, this God bless American name. A celebration so heavenward and wrong, it touches me to learn again and again that this my body, my dear and only body, one lovely chink in the whole damn night. Such as, my mother was a fever, my father was a restaurant, every noon he fed his lungs to an entire city, every night he held my belly searching for a suburb. I was the firefly that flared only once in my father's kingdom. I learned to speak English like a quick brick road. I split rocks in the back lot of my father's skull. I picked dandelions from the underarms of him, my father. I was the smell of ripe lemons in his oxbone nation. I was never brave, but he let me eat butter, held me like an egg. I was pure yolk and ate everything with my monster eye. Oh, did I mention my mother was the fever? That was my father, actually. Still, my father pressed against the door frame. My father was always the fever and always the restaurant. My father, whose splintered shoulders knew the words to one anthem only. Um, so I, I do identify as a queer person. I have um, al alternating gender presentations and all this stuff. Uh, but I, th I think, I mean, Clearly, I'm like Chinese American, um, but I think about migration also for queer people and the way that queer people, queer people are often forced to seek safety, you know, by crossing certain cultural lines and going to places like New York, for example, uh, where they feel safer to be to to live their truth. So when I first moved to New York, I um, started working as a makeup artist at Sephora. Uh, so I have a few poems about, I have a poem about my face, and then I have a poem about my mom's face. 
what do I make of my face except that it's on me? And its physicality, though not me, is how I've been addressed my whole boring life. When I was nine, I watched Aladdin and thought, after money, I wish for whiteness. I didn't even have all my teeth or vocabulary, just two yellow hands trying to catch the basketball my brother hurled at my face. When I was 19, my face erupted in nodular cysts, the bleeding Jupiter kind of sulfuric condensates and an alien registration. I had it all, a family, some secondhand sweatpants, a gender whose every sentence began when I was a boy, I looked like my mother. Now, more like father, baba, dad, and a full yard of irony waiting for lightning to lick me back. Once, I was on a gay date, just once, and a hunched over woman slipped me a white note. I thought it said Jesus, but instead Mario Badescu, the skincare brand I would sell months later when I learned to smother the errata of hormonal bludgeonings to the surface. Other children saw dermatologists dermatologists at the sight of a curly pube, while my own mother, when I was a boy, waited for her gallbladder to explode to get her, to get her gallstones removed. I watched her dimpled ass blow in the wind of the hospital hallway as she learned to walk again, and I slept in her bed and fed her plain contraband kanji. I am still talking about faces, the dented, fraxled, mole-scarred, and trenched ones. I took a pill many times that induced apoptosis, cell death. I could barely afford four months of my lips peeling like World War II wallpaper. The sex I was not supposed to have did not happen anyways. As a nude myself, I am cratered irreversibly. So why must I explain the thoughts I've had on the things I never got to decide? They happened to me, happen all the time, and I changed. I learned I could keep changing. I must to keep myself. little bit okay is this better yes. cool cool I saved the best poems for last so you didn't just I was doing vocal warm-ups um, Magritte my mother's face eclipsed by a spray of fortune cookies my mother's face eclipsed by the expiration of passports and my mother's face in window fans. In front of my mother's face, a brown paper bag, my denim button up, car door of the 97 Camry blown off my mother's face, stranger's lipstick, sunglasses lost and found my mother's face, behind beach balls, behind popsicles, every dollar bill obscures my mother's face, clarion, bird seed and canopy, my mother's face a shadow, recessed in shadows, the hot glow before ringing my mother's face a television, the whole vault of it, stars and still that shaft of water, my mother's face reflected in the well, it thrashes under wet immutable lid. So I, I do drag. Um, I had a big show last night uh, in New York. Yeah, yeah, and I'm so sleep deprived, but I'm so happy to be here. Um, it's sort of, I've been traveling a lot between New York and DC, which I think is like the only thing that Trump and I have in common. So maybe we can bond over that if we run into each other. Uh, my mother's bra. Limp, coarse, and unpadded, my mother wore the same bra for years. Years I watched it fade, white cotton lace stained cream gray in a frame that refused to fold. She never bought more. The first time I slipped it on, I was eight. I burst into the kitchen, mischievous as I was, and her face curled in disgust. She yelled. I watched my breast evaporate. Last week, I bought my first bra, clearance, 
black and double padded, an extra long clasp for a child with a rib cage built like a ship's. My lips, though, we don't talk, are hers, thick, thicker even. How could she detest me? Look at us, look, us together, sexy. So the first time I went back to China after I, I moved here was with my my mother for um, her mother's funeral. Uh, and um, when I just think hard about kind of the decisions that she had to make leaving China knowing that, not, knowing or not knowing if that would be the last time she would see her mother, it's just always uh, very emotional. So. Um, this is a poem titled, My Mother Watches Her Mother's Funeral Footage Again. She closed the doors and then the blinds and then her face midday. Everything there swollen, perennial. The VHS cassette of her mother at once entering and leaving the earth. Who could have steered into this poverty? Who could have steered? In the video, she spots herself wailing, clutching dirt, throwing earth back to stone. She is there, teeth mad and bowed before an altar, spread wide, ash heap, cow's blood, pig's feet, tangerines filed in rows. And she is not there. A dot climbs a mountain to put her mother away. A child with child's fingers ties twine into her mother's hair, yarn lost in the black glean, which grays when she unknots it at last. She, red shot, eyes staring past this quiet America, digs from her closet her oldest fur coat. Green emerges beaming and clothed in a new cut of sorrow. Um, yeah, so, not to make my life sound dramatic, uh, but back in 2011, the U.S. government tried to uh, deport my mom, dad, and I, um, and that's uh, thankfully been worked out through really expensive procedures, but uh, a few of these poems are kind of like informed by uh, the deportation process, or just the emotional state that that brought upon, so... Uh, okay. My life with newly painted nails is well, thank you. It mostly melts against me. I make stands like wall frame, high postured tinker toy, booger at Port Authority on the blue seat. Living is such wet data, and most me is breathing acrylic. So high consumption, that animal is sick. My mother dances the domestician in soiled clothes. She hasn't been promoted in years. The boundaries are negotiable. One trick is to simply not wear your own blood down the apron's front. Where I'm from, public art is gauche. I pissed on a red Christmas tree. Dead the day after a country tried deporting my family. In me squat in the dunes, blessed the granular white earth, and made the sound of crying. Unteamingly unfished in the broad Atlantic mouth. I have always loved the ocean. I love it for its size. It keeps itself hidden. From the interior of no imagining, salt water is one long sentence saying your pain is a chuckle compared to how I hold a billion glass lives. I gave no consent to what would and wouldn't live. I reserve the right to feel nothing. I keep for myself, myself. I wanted so many things, propped, top shelf. I find my feet, they sink, and I cannot travel. I have not touched a body like me. I release my feeling of rights. 
nothing of myself like me. Don't ask me how I'm feeling. It's not a fair question. Incrementally, you are American. Are a schedule of trash and debilitatory fire. A sad face, the kind that slips off when wet. Half of a whole mountain. Hmm. I'm gonna... I'm going to read this long kind of sequence of more prosy poems. Um, they're about my family's restaurant, but they're also about the television show Chopped. Because um, you, you can just watch that show um, when you're feeling sad and you just like, you know what's going to happen, you know? It's very grounding in that way. So I'll, I'll, I guess I'll end on this. Um, Chopped. Your arm jammed into the mouth of an elevator, the elevator doors gag open. What a relief. Two steps through the frame and into the empty car. Stagnant polyester and chipotle. Your shoulders drop at the closing of the door, slow and unnoticeable as, the air, as an air mattress deflating through the night. You wake up and you're on the ground. How is it this late? Zoned out of the mosaic floor, the brushed copper metal captures your likeness, murky and sympathetic. Sympathetic. By the time you crawl out, it will be dark, climbing the staircase into the parapet of your skull. Heat from the overhead seeps too tender, too tender to move, too tender to react. Another person steps in, and you have stood there for so long, puddled and breathing the same air, to the point where, where the elevator was mostly you. Atmosphere that has been you and been through you rushes out like a wound when a suit tie steps in. It's not even worth hiding. You're laughing so hard now. You've been here before. I just what makes you possible? In its premiere, you watched Chopped at Gold's Gym, bouncing on a treadmill toward a flat screen of competitors. You are the child of a restaurant, steeped in sodium and stir-fry. Something strange now. You're burning calories on a conveyor belt powered by the other burning of prehistoric flora. Relevant because how else were you born the second time? Immigrant children fly by the prehistoric burning. It's boring almost. At night, you slip into bed and wait to wake at the banging of, the, of your door by your brother's fists. For the next 12 hours, you stand next to your mother at the Fortune Gourmet. People eat rice, people sip cola, people drop broccoli on the carpet and flee. You were 16 then. You still had a healthy relationship with television. Darkness that is both early and late. At the 24-hour gym, clanging, 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 somebody else's engine revs the atmosphere, muscle, and gravity. What is being forged in the next room? Stronger than you, taller than you, longer-legged, has been here. Somebody just adjusted each machinery to not fit you. Somebody just ahead of you whose sweat smells like plain water. If this is not a metaphor for structural violence, then you are not living your life. Or, if you are living your life, which part exactly is metaphorical? The month you continued to ponder suicide, you were 16 and had stopped making eye contact with your family. Your entire family live, living their lives around you like a river to a stone. You spent a lot of time staring at the ceiling of your mother's 98 Camry, going from home to school to restaurant to home. By April, everything started to slide in and out of metaphor. Your father shucking armfuls of garlic in gray plastic bins, the footfall of soldiers marching in paper nightgowns, 50 pounds of chicken breasts stacked in a crooked tower on cardboard on ice. 
It's not dog meat, your brother says. And a cockroach falling on your face like a cockroach falling. This has not stopped. In college, you tried to get an Adderall prescription because you couldn't focus on your term paper about one of the Rosettis. Which one? There's a questionnaire in front of you and nothing else on the broad white table. A nervous woman with shallow nail beds pushes the form towards you. Please check all of the following behaviors and symptoms you consider problematic. Distractibility, check. Change in appetite, check. Hyperactivity, lack of motivation, check, check. Racing thoughts, check. Impulsivity, check. Boredom, check. Anxiety, worry, check, check. Sadness, check. Loneliness, check. Problems with school, check. Guilt, shame, check, check. Please provide us a list of your allergies. Cats? <laughs> So that's always confusing, right? Because if you're, if you're like a kid and your parents don't speak English and you like go in there as an eight-year-old and read those forms and like, they're like, oh, what are your parents' allergies? And you're just like, right, cat. Like, you know, like, it's not clear when you're so young, but yeah, that always confused me. <laughs> um, yesterday, you took a shit so big at the office that it, re that it refused to flush. It was a Monday. You remember your roommate once said that food is like paying rent to your body. In which case, how can you afford this? How long have you lived like this? When you yanked the lever to draw another surge of water, the turd stayed, dense and stayed, once, twice, three, four, five times, unimpressed by the rush of plumbing. The clear and swirling water around a single object. So terrified of your own feces, it's patriotic. You stare into the bowl with great reverential anxiety. It's like history, private, that only the parts of you unseen have memory of its creation. What in this world is so defiant, so honest and immune to eviction that it dares you to destroy it with your own two hands? Reading the Yelp reviews of your family's restaurant, what a mistake. <laughs> Lacking any lasting impression, the food is good, but the service is awful. Waitstaff is surly, inattentive. 23 reviews. Your mother's English bandaged with smiles, your father's eyes peeking out from the kitchen, and your brother, who remains an asshole in every description. Lauren M. details in a one-star review an argument over a delivery that he brought to her house. It's so authentic, it's painful to read. Your brother becomes angry and slams a full box of food onto her driveway. In February, the steam rises from the wet noodles on the asphalt, rising with his heavy breathing. Your brother is 32 and has spent exactly half his life delivering food. Your mother has shingles on her face and no doctor. Your father lives with hypertension and no doctor. You have a college degree and will not go back there. Lauren M's profile has zero friends and one review. After the intake therapist rejects your bid at an Adderall prescription, she informs you that you have a learning disorder. Also, it seems you've been bordering on depression for a while now. She looks so serious. How long have you been like this? You reject your first therapist when you meet her, an Asian woman who unsettles you by her likeness in academic English. As you backpedal from her office, you feel yourself standing on ice so crystal thin it is like touching the wet of an eyeball, and beyond it is yourself, alive and clawing into contact. You tell all this to the next white woman sitting across from you in a fold-up chair. Your mother's immigration, your brother's explosive and wasted life, your father's reserved devotion to the dream of you, how much you love ball sack and white cock, she stares at her wrists. It seems you have a lot of problems. 
adjusting her wristwatch. I'll see you next Monday. Her thumb presses on the glass face. All the potatoes on the ground. You are not meant for this. The camera zooms in on your front teeth, tearing open a parcel of dried shrimp. Pink grains, nymphic, tight, packed with 20 hundred eyes staring out, punctuate the air between your hands. Like a boat, nostalgic, filthy, arousal assaults you in a blast of seafood. You stare at Ted Allen's mouth for so long it begins to move. Tell me, chef, who are you competing for today? Your fingers grip around the handle of your cleaver, a deep breath. I'm competing today to honor my mother, who showed me what sacrifice and love could look like through her unforgettable cooking and life. At the word life, you tilt your head up and cue you tilt your head up on cue and rock your blade slowly into the heft of a red onion. Then you remember your mother is still alive. A tear slides down your face. This is my last one, thank you. Hair greased with the scent of bacon in five spice. You are either wild or whimpering as the train doors shoot open on the wrong side of the tracks. At the highest metro station in the world, your pupils refuse light. Sharp glimmers of Manhattan speckle your eyeline. It is like the wind of pigeons. It is rain not heavy enough to fall, and you are taking your first step into a life of air. You are slumped over your father's shoulder and see a shooting star cut through the sky. You are huffing yesterday's underwear. You are measuring your penis. You are meeting your father for the first time. You are feeding ducks at a pond. You are peeing on your lover's foot. You don't have a lover anymore. You don't have a lover yet. You are cackling under anesthesia. You are gone for two days. Then you are here forever. Thank you. One more time for both of our fantastic poets, Jose Gonzalez and Wo Chan. Yeah. So we have come to the open mic portion of our afternoon. Uh, we have a few poets on the open mic. Open micers, please, just one poem. Uh, we want to make sure everybody gets up here and. I'm nine months pregnant, which means I'm in a bad mood all the time. So don't make me <laughs> kick you off the stage because you're going over. Um, normally I'm nice, but not so much right now. Uh, audience, you also have a really important job, and that is to support everybody who comes up here with your wild applause. We actually get a lot of first timers here at Sunday Kind of Love, which is fabulous. And they need your love just like that, just like that. Let me feel it, let me feel it, let me feel it. See, now I'm, I just feel brave. So please, do give that love to everybody who comes up here. Um, so what happens is, if you sign up second, but nobody signs up first, you're first. That's how that works. So Simone, get ready. Um, Dan is on deck after Simone. But I am going to read uh, the poem that comes from uh, the line of our, our community poem, which I'm going to check on right now. Where is that community poem? Out there, there it is. Okay, anybody who hasn't signed that, make sure you get to add a line. Just look at the line before yours and then write what your response to that so we can get it around to as many people. Um, and this poem uh, is Hugh Min Nguyen. And I want to give a shout out to Hugh. Hugh doesn't have a book yet, which is like crazy to me, but I'm sure that's going to change very, very soon. Please check him out um, online if you just search his name because his poems are really powerful. Um, this one in particular. I feel like I don't share the story, but I know the shame. You know, I can really feel it. So uh, please do check him out. This poem is called Changeling. Standing in front of a mirror, my mother tells me she is ugly, says the medication is making her fat. I laugh and walk her back to the bed. My mother tells me she is ugly in the same voice she used to say, no woman could love you. 
and I watch her pull at her body, and it is mine. My heavy breast, my disappointing shape. She asks for a bowl of plain broth, and it becomes the cup of vinegar she would pour down my throat. Every day after school, I would kneel before her. I would remove my clothes and ask her to mark the progress. It's important that I mention I truly wanted to be beautiful for her. In my dreams, I am thin, and if not thin, something better. I tell my mother she is still beautiful, and she laughs. The room fills with flies. They gather in the shape of a small boy. They lead her back to the mirror, but my reflection is still there. That's Hugh Min Nguyen. Give it up for Hugh. He's fantastic. And keep that applause going for our first open micer, Simone Roberts. Give it up for Simone. Hi. Use the mic. I, yeah, I gotta stand right here, or you'll never hear me. <laughs> Thank you. So I don't know why, but we live in by live and die by uh, sort of the president's tweets anymore. And he says irresponsible things. And I want us to know that we are going to make it through every single one of those things. Yeah. So, uh, this tweet. Oh, let it be an arms race then. We will outmatch them at every pass and outlast them all. Oh, then let it be an arms race to blow it all to kingdom come. Let the sky glow darkly and prowling with fury liquefy or open its mouth to scream and the air run off to safer planets. Oh, let it be an arms race to lift each other just slightly up now. Support the back, open the chest, and chase the air, chasing the sky. Laced arms and great arched trunks. We could be our own damn fence, a shelter for someone softer, a watershed of arms encircling anyone thirsty on the wrong end of the old world's fear and its metal and its trembling law. Oh, let us be a race to gaze longest into each other's eyes, to see the dust of long dead stars, blasted and never known planets swirling and waving in the tides of our blood anyway. A bit of the great ocean spilling maybe over the lid and onto the cheek. So difficult is it for mortals to stare to the back of time and say yes. Oh, let it be an arms race to speak the language of adoration with our hands. An arms race to quiet, cry the widest yes to every future we must live into now. Even that one where you know the one, a tiny star returns us to being stars. Let us live into whatever may come singing. If we must embrace it, a flashing end, let the boiling air slam our ghosts into the shattering walls behind us like graffiti sprayed by the angel of history, a world of turning to rumble in the wings, sky wide wake. Let, oh then, let this end with photoing negatives of our last being, our arms braced behind each other's backs, holding each other up and ready and forward into this yes even into this yes and a future race yes of more intelligent yes and gentle beings yes we'll see our ghosted shadows yes and tell stories about never giving in and never yes oh yes letting fall yes Thank you, Simone. Um, so I forgot to remind you that if you don't want to be filmed, please uh, say so when you get up to the mic. So hopefully Simone does not mind being filmed. Okay, um, so please do say that if you don't want to be filmed. Um, so I want to give a shout out um, again, Sarah mentioned this, but for our next Open Micers postcards, because he's an amazingly talented painter, uh, as well as poet, and he paints lovely, 
many lovely things, but one of the lovely things he paints are pictures of his adorable dog, Blossom, who I love and does not, she does not care about my existence at all. That's okay. Um, so please do consider purchasing those postcards and give it up now for Dan Vera. So uh, my dog does uh, feature in this poem. Um, <laughs> I didn't think about that at the time. Uh, I am married to a morning, po uh, morning person. Um, and the only person who says stuff like that uh, are people who are not morning uh, people. Uh, I'm not a morning person. Um, we tolerate each other uh, or sort of respect that one of us is going to get up early with the dog uh, and walk her. Um, but after the election, I've become a morning person. And uh, I know that's because I have a hard time sleeping. Um, and so it's sort of thrown me off. And so I've tried to sort of embrace that and, and find a way of sort of kind of waking up and um, you know, putting myself uh, to the page. And uh, this poem uh, is, in a way, a found poem. It's uh, having the experience and then coming across a very odd news item that put it in perspective. It's titled, Like Carp Played Mozart. And it starts with a very odd epigraph, which is the news item. The latest Mozart research is not on humans, but on carp. Researchers at the Agricultural University of Athens played Mozart's Ina Klein and Nacht music to carp to test its relaxing and antidepressant effects. The music was played underwater to carp for 30 minutes at a time. The results show that the fish exposed to music grew more and in some cases had less stress. This morning we lay in darkness the dog curled along your side, my alarm dancing with your alarm as we snooze to put off the day, until I nuzzled you, warm touch across cold morning bed. Our voices remain silent to not disturb the cold morning air, till the dog stretched beside you to note her waiting wakefulness as we spoke about the dinner the night before the argument averted over cards with friends, and I recalled a meditation program. I then played you. Ten minutes we lay in silence, listening to a voice guide us through orderly breathing, the presence of inhalation, the timed exhalation, the feeling of our heads to toes, a kindlier way to begin our days, the news would bring an outrage or atrocity with another bully in the White House. But for these few minutes, we held warmth in silence, allowed ourselves to lie inside of it, listening to the cadence of our breathing before we staggered upright, like carp being played a little night music underwater. Thank you. Dan, are, are carp particularly depressed? Having, I don't know. I didn't know that about carp. Um, Shy is coming up next, and I didn't warn you, Shy. So I'm going to give you a second to get to get together. Um, Sagani is on deck after Shy. Um, to, to let everybody know that although. You know, my pride makes me want to be the only host who can open my queue, but I don't want to deny you the experience of other hosts here at Busboys. And there are so many because there are many open mic events at Busboys all across the city, in fact. Mondays are at Sherlington and Brookland. Tuesdays are here at 14th and B. Wednesdays are at 5th and K. Thursdays are at Hyattsville and sometimes Tacoma. Anacostia is opening soon. Busboys just taken over. So please do visit those other open mics and bring your poems. Is that enough time, Shy? Where's Shy? Hey, here we go. Give it up for Shy L, who's coming up now. I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness trying to be heard. So you pass 
pass me this mic and you ask for some spoken word. And all I ask is that you might sit back and observe this art form known as poetry and let me be heard. Spoken word. <laughs> I'm not a preacher, but when I speak it's like a sermon. And my name ain't Jeremiah, but when I got something to say it feels just like fire burning. Shut up in my bones because I put God first. But second come my poems, see, my rhymes are all I have. My pens, my pencils, my pads, my thoughts come to life when I write. And I'm one of the few left who can hold up this light, carry this torch, and keep it burning bright. See, we are the inherent storytellers of the earth, and we've been destined to do this since birth. And for what it's worth, you call me an MC. But I'm the truth like LeBron James, the chosen one like Carmelo Anthony. And I ain't one twelve, but the way the rhythm get into what I'm saying, it'll make you want to dance with me, yes. I'm poetic, and don't you forget it, as my words hit your ears, just sit back and let it marinate and sink in. My tongue is a brush, dipping in this colorful palette of words to create a picture and show you what I'm thinking. Taking you on a journey over twists and curves without even blinking. Y'all say, what is she thinking? But try to understand, I'm not Peter Pan, but my rhymes will take you up so high you'll feel like you'll never land. And I have to tell Nas, it's not enough for me to know I can. I must step up to the mic and show I can. But before I can even get my words to connect, you ignore and reject me, placing me into the same category as a lame. You know, those girls who all look the same, sound the same, dress the same. Another little, what's her name? <laughs> nah, that ain't me, cause like a broken Xbox, I don't really play no games, and I can't quite put my pinky on what it is. Excuse me. <laughs> but maybe it's cause I have a brain and I use it. And if anyone could ever try to take over the world, it's sure enough me, your girl. Mouth almighty, blazing joints like Spike Lee. I write in dark ink, so don't take my words lightly. Cause though I might be just one voice, it's almost crazy how much I choice. It's almost crazy how much I have a choice to the message I choose to convey and how because this may be my last chance to open up my mouth or rather your last chance to hear poetry in motion and I bring these words to life like Lazarus and I'm not saying that I'm Christ but I think you get the point. And just like Jesus wept for his friend who was in the grave, I too weep for a tradition that needs to be saved and I'm doing my best to revive it. Not playing a part, speaking my mind, but straight from the heart. I'm real, realize it. Not commercial like those anti-drug slow slogans. So be like SpongeBob and let it soak in. Not rap, but spoken. Dead poets awoken in me. Compromising my image to be on TV is not likely. I'm that real thing saying about by Marvin Gaye because ain't nothing like me and I refuse to just do it like Nike cause if I'ma do it then I'ma do it right see yeah. my government name is not my claim to fame it's how I tie your brain in knots you can't tame my thoughts cause I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness trying to be heard and in the beginning was the word <laughs> thank you Shai said I ain't 112. That's not the only thing I heard, but that stuck with me. Because I like 112. I'm not going to fret. All right, on deck is Fernando, and coming up now is Sagani. And it, it's either Tane or Fred, I'm not sure, so you're going to have to tell us. Okay, you got it. All right, give it up. Um, so my name is Sagri and I have really bad handwriting. Um, <laughs> this poem is about, um, I don't know if y'all know, but two or three weeks ago there was a whole kind of spree of um, attacks in Pakistan and um, a lot of people died, dozens if not hundreds of people died. Um, about a week after that there were three, in the same week, um, attacks on Indian American men in the United States, in Kansas and South Carolina, and two people died. So this poem is about 
the practice that I'm good at now, but wasn't always good at, of reading the news and suddenly being transported to another place where you gotta message family and you gotta check up on your mom, um, and then you return back to the other place, uh, back to wherever, what everyone else is consuming. Um, so I hope you like it. Thank you so much for the space. Uh, it's called Ravel Pindi. You have lived 10 years with the Texas sun burning softly in your mother's home. Today, the newspaper comes from a place that lived in her cabinets. It is a symphony of red, a tapestry of leaking. You blink as your mother begins to drip quietly. You watch her shelter in your father's collarbones. Don't know, from when does she hear stacked brown bodies? And you know, for the first time, that your stomach is a sheath for a scythe you have never seen. You will spend another 10 years tracing its steel, reading the moisture of tattered flesh, hoping it will sing you the symphonies your parents have witnessed. Thank you. Thank you, Sadi. That was lovely, and your scarf game is also on point, I just want to note. Um, community poem, I have to come get that. So where did that end up? I hope a lot of people got to, okay, fantastic, I'm gonna come get it. Uh, on deck is Nikki, and coming up now is Fernando Salazar. Fernando, there's Fernando. Give it up for Fernando coming all the way from the back. Keep it going until he gets to the stage. Uh, hey y'all, uh, let me see, is this right? Okay, um, so this is my first time reading here. Um, thank you. And um, I just want to thank um, our poets for sharing themselves with us and I wasn't even intending on reading but thank you so much. Um, I just moved from New Mexico about uh, almost a year ago. Okay. Where am I from? I'm from cities of gold, mountains made of fruit. Cornelio el Mayordomo controlling the acequias that cut across the valley like so many wrinkles in his tough hands. Where chile burns green, satisfying the hunger of children with skin the same color of pintos without freckles, cooked. I'm from Las Tres Hermanas where squash, beans, and corn helped each other grow. Why can't we? I'm from too many cars in the driveway and riding the central bus with mama to school. From being late and looking guiltily at the staff person. From realizing that tardy was actually tarde and then it making sense that I was always tarde. <laughs> I think of you riding the bus back to work. Think of you thinking of him of how much easier it would be if he'd teach you to drive. I think of you riding your bike to take me to school, your precious cargo singing ABCs down to the guarderia. I think of sleeping in that bed on the floor, of feeling safe in your smell. I think of you, strong woman, smiling at viejitas in el bus, contando y cantando, making me copy Shel Silverstein poems in the morning before I could sneak out in the summers. I think of loud parties with dancing, of neighbors coming upstairs to say, please, it's a Thursday. <laughs> I think of catching lizards, of manhunt, of soccer in the park, and how small our apartment complex seemed when I went back so many years after. I think of strength when I think of you, of smelling flowers and crying, of learning the names of the flowers you stocked at the Costco, of sitting under the table and reading. I think of you, mujer, madre lobo, being exhausted from packing flowers, hands swollen, eyes red, allergic to your work, still pushing. I think of you smiling in the sun, and I want everyone to know you. I want them to teach you in the classes on history. 
I want to cut out the tongue of those that would hate you and make an ají de lengua for them to taste their own bitterness mixed with the heat and spice of your recipe. Quiero gritar a la señora que, tuve, que tuvo la desgarra para decir English only when I was walking on campus. English only. English only stops up mi lengua. English only makes people see mi madre as an outsider. English only pushes me further out. English only allows one story to be told. Porque tuve que traducir estos pensamientos. English only. Solamente inglés. Solamente inglés. Una solamente. Just one mind. English. Simple minded English only. is on deck and coming up next is Nikki T. Where's Nikki T? Nikki T, come on up here. Give it up for Nikki T. All right. Hey, how are you? Hi. So it's my first time performing here. And it's my birthday. So Yes, 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 it's my birthday. So, um, so yeah, my name is Nikki T, and um, I'm from New York. Anybody else from New York? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, so, <coughs> this poem is actually, um, this poem is called Girls Like Us, so um, I'm just gonna dive into it, all right? So. Before you hit the corner, you checked your reflection in the window of that old hoopty. The lip gloss on your lips seemed to shine like diamonds. Your jeans hugged your hips like two friends that hadn't seen each other in years. Your face looked like God came down and beat it himself. That shot your confidence through the roof so you didn't just arrive but merely pragmatized on that corner. Strutting so hard, even the devil looked up for a minute. 30 seconds for the light to change this. The moment you've been waiting for this. The moment you went from girl to macrocosm. Center of this hood universe, all eyes drawn to you as if you were the last goddess. 10 seconds in, you felt a gentle pull on your arm only to find this. Fine ass man with cocoa butter skin and hazel eyes staring at your backside. He knew only to look and dare not touch cause you go zero to hundred real quick. <laughs> only 20 seconds left. There wasn't enough time for him to spit game but he still tried. Turn the concrete to quicksand when he said your frame is something to be marveled at. The fact that your boat was sailing into uncharted waters made you so uneasy. But something about this encounter made you want to keep going. Fast forward to date night, smooth sailing. He showed up in a tailored suit with a bouquet of white gardenias. Made you feel like Billie Holiday that night. And as you both put all your cards out on the table, he saw you for who you really are. And that was all you ever wanted. But just like how there's two sides to every coin, on the flip side, smooth sailing up to date night, he showed up in a tailored suit with a bouquet of white gardenias, and you both put all your cards out on the table, but you held one back. The secret you kept buried deep inside you, clawed at the back of your throat in hopes of finally being set free. But insecure girls will always be the first ones talking. Things took a serious turn when he said, my homegirl told me something about you. And as many times as you've been in this position, you were always unprepared for it. Whispers in the wind told him that you, <coughs> sorry, whispers in the wind told him that you were born a male. His hand recoiled something like a semi-automatic. The levees in your eyes broke and the flash flood of tears cascaded down your face. How could you tell him? How could you tell him that the sea cups he had been staring at all night was just a padded bra and chicken cutlass? That your perfectly cinched waist was just an optical illusion due to a waist trainer? That the reason why you couldn't stay out too late was because of the imminent return of that five o'clock shadow? How could you tell him that you were brought into this world in the wrong body and you've done everything you can to change that? How could you tell him that you were transgender? He's not with that gay shit, stormed off and left you at the table, silly. 
Girls like you don't get the happy ending. And I know it hurts so bad to constantly be degraded, honey, speaking from experience. Girls like us get broken down piece by piece, brick by brick, and have to find the strength to put ourselves back together again. Girls like us get murdered out here in these streets and our cries for help fall on deaf ears. Girls like us have to try 10 times harder than the real females. They paint targets on our backs and expect us to keep calm, but how can you keep calm when you have to constantly look over you? you know? Oh my God, why is that happening? <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, my mouth is like super dry and I totally should have drank water. They paint targets on our backs and expect us to keep calm, but how can you keep calm when you have to constantly look over your shoulder? We sell ourselves out here on these corners. Girls like us get cut open, stitched up, and labeled as monsters by society, but girls like us are tired of fighting. But it's okay to let your tears hit that tablecloth. Walk out with your head held high, because those girls will always be watching. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> the water came, thank you. So I just want to say like really quickly, um, thank you guys so much. Um, I do have a YouTube channel. I actually uh, post videos that I make for some of the poems that I write and everything like that. So Girls Like Us is actually on my YouTube channel. I do have some cards if you want to get back to me after the show is done. Definitely do that. Thank you guys so much for this, thank you. Happy, happy birthday. Or, or we could do, go, go Nikki, it's your birthday. Either, however you want to do it, we could do either one for you. Uh, um, Bloomy, Bloomy is up next. Where's Bloomy? Is this Bloomy? Bloomy is coming up. Give it up for Bloomy, y'all. Oh, we can do better than that for Bloomy. So much love. There we go. All right. This ain't no time for no riddles or no rhymes. I had to put the liquor down so I could say what's on my mind. Blowing up your speakers with that wisdom from above. Though the world seems to be faded, Jesus still sits on the throne. I can tell you vibing from the way that's handed to the song. And if you want to come with me, use this beat to carry on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but ain't nobody perfect. Jesus died for us even though it wasn't worth it. Nah. And no, we ain't deserve it. Nah, and we ain't do nothing to earn his love, but that's just the way it goes. Gave up his only son for me so he can save my soul. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Said it in Isaiah 54 chapter, verse 17. Man, it's good to know that. It's good to know the origin when you want to state the facts. What's in that truth that you don't find nowadays? Funny how the money seems to stimulate the brain. People going under because we living in the days. But living in this world means you going to go through some pain. And if you leave to lay up, ask yourself what was the aim? Man, got your jersey on, but you not ready for the the game. Don't let Satan confuse you when God already made it plain. Yes, he made it simple. Your body is a temple. Keep him on your mental cause he'll be back in a twinkle of an eye. Don't ever let these words go and pass you by. He said my future's bright so they'll always be on my back. But I got something for them when they try to attack. Pow, pow, what's that? Didn't see it coming. Put the full armor of God on. Now they all gonna take off running. Scary. Time for Bloomy, first time on the stage. All right, so we have one more open mic reader, but before we bring that person up, audience, the moment has come. I'm going to read you your community poem. I know, oh, it's so exciting. Um, so if I can't read your handwriting, what I do in place of whatever word I can't read is just say poetry. Yeah, so feel free to say it with me if, if it happens. So it starts with our line from Human Nguyen. Standing in front of a mirror, I see two selves reflected. One an outline of self, but neither a true representation of me. 
Who am I really seeing in this reflection? What is a self even? Deep, audience, getting deep right away. What makes today different from yesterday? They say I'm not enough, but hope makes me enough for anything. Positivity grants me power to perform. Faith empowers me to keep pushing on. Let's go, boys. <laughs> I whisper, staring back into my own eyes. Am I afraid? Am I nervous? Should I love the person standing in front of me in the mirror as I too am America? I too am America and America is born in me. So is the blood of my ancestors that flows within me. Nor my skin nor the texture of my hair or my ethnicity defines the true me. See me here still unfolding like the flower we were all promised, but instead were given these delicate chains gripping me softly. Mm. Keeping my two selves dissonant, my dreams too lofty, they shut us up because they're afraid of our moon power. But I call them to a higher vibration, I expect more of them. From under beds and other dark places, they show their faces hid for so long. As a black dreamer, are my thoughts nightmares? Do these thoughts silence my fears? Fear not, sweet one, my mother says. Simone, Simone says. Simone. <laughs> that wasn't you, Simone? Okay. We are all the same, beautiful, until the street lights turn on and some of us disappear because the light reveals what makes us invisible. Visible music now among us. Love, love you once again, again, and again, until time means nothing. That is your community poem audience. Give it up for yourselves. Powerful work. I'm impressed. I keep that applause going for our very last open micer, my fabulous co-host, Sarah Browning. Katie Ritchie, everybody, hostess with the mostest, and the baby coming on. Let's give it up for all our open micers. Wow, what a night. And Wo Chan, and Jose B. Gonzalez. Jose has his book, Toys Made of Rock, only $5. See him after. He will sign it for you. Books are beautiful. Yes, books, books are revolutionary $10. now. $10. And only $10, what did I say? $5. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not quite. Only $10, come on. A deal at any rate. $50, whatever. Anyway, buy the books, give them away, share them, read them. Come out next weekend for the finals for the DCU Slam team. You will not regret it. It is the best evening of your life after this evening, of course. Next month, Sunday Kind of Love right here, Joe Ross launching his new book, Ache. And April 21st, Freedom Plow Award for Poetry and Activism. Grab your flyers on the way out. Buy your merchandise. Sign up for Split This Rock Listserv. Get your poem of the week on a Friday morning. People write us, it's the highlight of their week. Yeah, so I'm gonna close with a, a poem of my own on our theme, migration. <coughs> and um, uh, my second book is coming out in September. Thank you. In October, we are going to have a dance party. Book launch dance party. Um, so you're all invited. Bring your mamas and your lovers and your friends and your babies. It's gonna be fun. Uh, I don't know where yet, but we're working on it, so. <laughs> this is the last poem in the manuscript. The manuscript is called, uh, the book. The book is called Killing Summer. And this is the flag of no walls. On the border with Mexico, we call it a fence. As if to lean on its top, 
chat with those neighbors to the south, trade rakes, trade gossip, call it a fence, call it a gate, call it good, still Nogales, Arizona, Nogales, Sonora, trench, ground sensors, infrared, night vision scopes. In Palestine, the land's already been taken, families on one side, orange groves on the other. Ours is a culture of many walls, the Saudi poet writes in her email. Young people sat on the Berlin Wall and waved the flags of their future. I want a flag that waves like that, for bricks that go home in tourist luggage, for the Saudi poet and her sisters, for touch. I want the flag of men waiting for work in the morning chill of the 7-Eleven parking lot, the flag of nannies pushing strollers to the park for fellowship and swings, flag of the women who spend each day changing the soiled sheets of their new country. I want the flag of talking, of sitting on the disintegrating wall and gabbing, gossiping, negotiating, waving that flag of no walls, that flag. Thank you. Have a great night. Buy the books, buy the merchandise. We'll see you next month. We'll see you at all the good things. Love one another. We need each other badly. Thank <laughs> you.